Sometimes Ryan underscore asks, what are the real benefits to brands creating their own material technology? Example, Uniqlo Airism. Is it all just for marketing? Do they actually innovate in the fabric space? So it is 100% marketing when it comes to branded names of Airism, Luxstream, uh, New Lu, Luan from Lululemon. It's all just to differentiate yourself ultimately in a very competitive and saturated marketplace when it comes to fabrics. And oftentimes when it comes to fabrics, a lot of consumers don't know the differences. So you need these names to differentiate it because you can get two fabrics that are 70% nylon, 30% spandex, and they can be completely different. But if you just kind of benchmark yourself against the composition, I think you're doing yourself as a brand a very much a disservice because your fabric might have 70-30 and another one might have 70-30 and your fabric might be significantly better based on how it performs and all your product development. You know, anytime we develop a fabric for a client, we always tell them to brand it because at the end of the day, that fabric is going to be for them and for them only because oftentimes, even if brands try to copy that fabric, it's quite difficult to copy, especially synthetic fabrics. So at the end of the day, it's a lot of marketing, but it's also very important marketing to do. Underscore Fabian C7 asks, can you please talk about t-shirt fit and why it is more complex and costly to make sleeves that don't flare out slash fit well? Okay, so that's gonna be for two reasons. One is when you're ever actually making a new garment, you're actually going to be putting it flat and you're gonna be pressing it. And a lot of times that crease from pressing it is gonna be on the outside, which is causing it to flare out more. But I think right now you're seeing a lot of garments with the arms flaring out because everyone wants to make these drop shoulder tees. They're copying often existing brands and then they want to throw in very heavy fabric because that's very much on trend right now. And when you bring in that heavy fabric for a existing silhouette that's been designed off thinner fabric, that fabric is going to want to retain its shape. It's going to want to stick out more. It's not going to drape as much as a thinner fabric. So you're getting a lot of brands now having this flared out look because they don't have the product development experience to know that, hey, you actually have to change the, the shape of that panel to accommodate a thicker fabric. You can't just copy an existing design. Rich underscore Monet asks, can you make a video on care instructions? A lot of people these days seem to ignore them, but they should be followed. Yeah, you know, we actually are knee deep in construction right now on pretty much North America's first brand development center. Once that's kind of finished construction by end of summer, we're gonna be doing a lot of new series that we're gonna be starting to showcase. And we're gonna be diving in a lot more into the product development side of, of fashion and, and showing you guys how it's done. Or when it comes to care instructions, a lot of existing brands will just throw on like hand wash only, hang dry, dry clean only on like a t-shirt. And that's just a brand kind of saying, hey, we know this is not gonna last that well, but we're gonna put these care instructions so that when consumers throw it through the regular laundry, they're gonna actually have a lot of issues and they can't blame us for it. It's such a sketchy side of fashion that most people don't realize that brands are just trying to get away with a lot of these things. That's wild. Yeah. What the hell? Like the Miri shirt, why is dry clean only on a t-shirt? Zapata Palm asks, I really want to do some similar 3D text on future design. What are some tips you have to make it not easy to fall off? We're going to, again, we're going to do a lot of new series once our development center is done on this, but straight things to do right off the bat. Avoid very thin letters, avoid any thin lines, avoid any tiny floating elements. Usually when you're going to do a lot of 3D prints, you want to make sure that the letters are bolded, they're thicker, so they have enough area to actually bond to the fabric. The looser knit your fabric is, if you're doing a very loose knit single jersey, you're gonna need thicker letters compared to if you're doing something like a very tight knit interlock, like ligging or um, athletic apparel. So that's the one thing to keep in mind is the substrate's gonna matter quite a bit on how the final application is. But we're gonna dive into this a lot more down the road. Gail says, hi, thank you for this video. I'm looking to make leggings in a jacket with this fabric that has a print pattern and the samples that came back here were so sheer using like pink. Do you think dyeing the base of the fabric can fix this as it's currently white or do I have to line it? So when it comes to printing on fabrics, there's gonna be multiple ways to do it. Dye sublimation is a very common one and you'll find a lot of like very cheap kind of like dupe leggings on Amazon or Shein leggings using dye sublimation. And it's usually gonna be on a polyester base and it's gonna be white 
And you'll know it because whenever you're you're wearing a legging like that and you say you stretch around your knees, that's all of a sudden all the white comes through. And then on the other side, you're gonna get all over printing. It's almost like a, think of like an inkjet printer on fabric. When it comes to fabric being sheer on prints, you need to dye the fabric. So what we always do for all of the prints we do for our, our clients is first, obviously you're gonna go through what's called strike offs, which is gonna be the print on the fabric. And usually that's gonna be on a white base just to verify the print. But then what we always do is we choose the lightest color on the print and we dye the fabric that color. That way, when you go into bulk manufacturing, you at least have that fabric as the base to avoid the whiteness. However, depending on how light the print is and depending how light the base fabric is, you still may run into sheerness issues. It's a lot more complex than can be answered in one question, but we'll dive into this much deeper in the future. But at the end of the day, whenever you are doing a print, if you can have enough volume, you usually need around like 150 meters for an all over print, try to always dye the base of the fabric. You're gonna end up with a much better product and you're gonna avoid that stretchy white look that just really looks cheap at the end of the day. Beef Cheap 3206 asks, does a 6040 poly cotton blend inherently end up pilling? You see the same kind of blends in more expensive brands than this like Patagonia for example. Or are there more premium ways of managing for poly cotton that avoid pilling? So usually whenever you're gonna get a poly cotton, so it's gonna be 60% cotton, 40% polyester, that's done for lowering manufacturing costs, also lowering duties because the cotton is more than 50%, so you get a cheaper duty rate. So whenever you're doing a 60% cotton, 40% polyester, brands always do this to lower duties and to lower manufacturing costs, plus you get a little dimensional stability in there. But whenever you see that blend, it's always gonna be fiber blended. And what does that mean? It means that they're getting the polyester filaments and they basically chop them up and they mix it in with the cotton and then they spin it into yarn. So when you're doing that, instead of the polyester being long continuous filaments, there are all these chopped up little fibers and those little fibers all have chances to get loose because it's not one filament. There's all these tiny little ones that can pop up here and there from the yarn and unravel. And over time, those filaments are going to wrap around each other and that's what's going to cause pilling. So whenever you see a blend like that and tri blends are also a big issue, you're always gonna really run into issues with pilling compared to a 100% cotton, which is gonna be a lot more resistant to pilling. Tolerance and Peril asks, I really like the review of a more everyday shirt. Great video. I find though that sometimes if an A-line cut is too wide at the bottom hem, it actually accentuates the dad bod. Do you agree? So when it comes to the bottom hem, it's gonna serve two purposes. One is to finish the bottom of the, the shirt, the fabric. Another one is that it's basically gonna set the sizing at the bottom of the shirt because it's gonna be stiffer at that hem. So you need to find the right balance of not being too tight to the belly. So, you know, let, let's assume that this is the belly for a dad bod. If your bottom hem is too tight, that fabric is now being pulled around the belly and it's gonna showcase it more. If that bottom hem is too large, now it's going to go around the belly and go straight down or flare out and it's gonna hang and you're basically going to, it's almost like you're exposing the belly. It's like a, like a skirt. Um, where you need to do is you need to find the right balance. And this is why a fit model that has the same body type as your target demo is so important. You need to find the right balance where that bottom hem sits just right near the crest of the belly. So the, the fabric isn't too far out and isn't too far in. So it makes the right balance of sitting just at the right spot for your target consumer. And you know, fabric's gonna play a big part of this as well how it drapes, how it conforms to the body. And this is where you really need to spend a lot of time in your product development process to make these fine tweaks so that your target demo ultimately looks the best in the garments that you're creating. If you guys wanna see more behind the scenes secrets on the fashion industry and learn more about how to create products and brands, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and check out these videos.